Stephen Brill is here. He wrote the cover story of this week's Time magazine. It is called Bitter Pill, My Medical Bills Are Killing Us. It is the longest piece by a single author ever published by Time. It took Brill seven months to research and write. He analyzes bills from hospitals, doctors, and drug companies to paint an extraordinary picture of medical overspending. I am pleased to have Stephen Brill back at this table. Welcome. Thanks, Charlie. What got you here? This longest piece. Well, as you know, I like to pick topics where I, I just feel that I'm curious about them. And for a long time, I've just been curious about why health care costs so much. You know, we've had years of debate about who should pay for health care, how, how should we do insurance, and who should pay the bills. But I've never seen anyone stop to say, hey, wait a minute, how come it'll cost you twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars if, God forbid, you know, as you're walking out of this building, uh, you slip and fall and land on your elbow. Okay. Why will it cost a million dollars if you're diagnosed with cancer? How come? Who's getting the money? Okay, but just tell me, you, because of all your interest, uh -huh. from the law to yeah. politics to education, yeah. right. come to this subject. Did I mean, did you be begin reading, or did I Rick just, Stingle call you up and say, no, we no, need no, a good no, piece on the the medical care no, costs? I just like to pick topics. I didn't know anything about education right. when I started. I like to pick topics that... I don't necessarily know anything about that I think I can learn about. And everybody cares about health care, and everybody is affected by bills. And it just struck me that I'd never really read anything that said, okay, here's why it costs this much. Who's making the money? Yeah. GE's making the money on the CAT scans, and the hospital CEO, it turns out, is making you know two or three or four million dollars. That's the stuff I started to find out. So you did that by simply doing what any good reporter does, go to the original source. I just got bills. Everybody said, well, first of all, you're never going to be able to get bills because there are privacy issues. And I said, well, I'll promise the patient's privacy, but some of these patients will be so angry that they'll beg me to put their names in, which is what mm -hmm. happened. And then came the really hard part. The bills, if you've ever looked at a hospital bill, and you may not have because you have good insurance, the bills are indecipherable. They're in, they're in like double code. And... No consumer can understand those bills. They're in acronyms and numerical codes. And line by line, I just decoded them and figured out what they cost. For example, if uh, one of the patients is getting a cancer drug from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, I figured out how much it costs the hospital to buy that drug. The hospital was selling it to the patient for X thousand. It cost the hospital one-fourth of that or one-third of that, and then how much did it cost the drug company to produce the drug? Mm. Well, uh, the drug companies like to brag to their investors about you know their high gross profit margins, which is great stuff if you're talking to investors, not great stuff if it's going to be in an article in Time magazine about how mm. come uh, this cancer drug you know, is costing so much money. I just want to quote from you, and we've already covered this point. Uh, you say, when we debate health care policy in America, we seem to jump right to the issue of who should pay the bills, blowing past what should be the first question, why exactly are the bills so high? Exactly. And, and if you compare us to other countries, we spend the price for prescription drugs in the United States is 50% higher. Mm. As a general matter, we spend much, 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 much more per capita for healthcare than any developed country. That's the bad news. The worst news is our results are terrible. In that sense... So we're paying one, getting less. Yeah. It, I mean, in that sense, it is, I mean, it is a bit like uh, the book I wrote about education, yeah. which is we spend more on education, the results are not as good. Here we spend much, much more on healthcare, and uh, the results what? are not good. Tell me about this concept of charge masters. Ah. This was the thing, you know, among the categories of things that affect all of our lives that we never knew about, this would be high on the list. Every hospital has this giant list, six, seven, eight thousand items called the Charge Master. Again, it's all sort of in code and acronyms, but if a nurse gives you a cup uh, to take a pill, the cup is listed in the Charge Master. The cup, the little paper cup, might be six dollars. If you get a chest x-ray, that's something else in the charge master. Every hospital's charge master is different. None of them are consistent. None of them make any sense. And most of all, there isn't a single hospital administrator who can explain how the charge master prices came to be. Mm -hmm. And and none of them want to talk about it. Uh, you have expressed this notion too that powerless buyers in a seller's market 
where the only sure thing is the profit of the seller. Exactly. Well, and and that's why Not you can have a charge it? master. I mean, you know, uh, you're wearing um, a really nice tie. Yeah. So if you walked into a tie store and said, "How much is that tie?" The first thing that would be different from the medical marketplace is uh, you'd get to know how much the tie is before you buy it, mm -hmm. which doesn't happen in a hospital. The second thing that would be uh, that would be different is if uh, the person running the store said, oh, that tie, that tie is going to be $6,000. You'd get to decide not to buy it. You'd say $6,000 for a tie. Are you kidding? I'm not, you know, not, you know, not even Charlie Rose is going to spend $6,000 for a tie. The third thing that would happen is there might be another tie store up the block where you could look at ties. So there might be competition. Typically in a hospital situation or in a laboratory situation, the doctor sends you for a test or the doctor sends you to the hospital. You don't know what the prices are. And after you get the bill, you can't understand the bill. If you're insured, you may not care what the bill says. In fact, you'll feel great because your $6,000 tie will have been discounted by the insurance company to $3,000, and they'll pay 80% of the $3,000, and you'll feel terrific, except the, ca uh, the only difference is the tie actually costs the hospital uh, maybe six dollars to make. Mm. Oh, you know, testing is so a good. big problem too. Oh, totally. It's a you know routine testing. It's a profit center for hospitals and for doctors. doctors and they now do have it their because they want to. A, they know it's a profit center, but also because they want to avoid lawsuits. Exactly, or because they say they want to avoid lawsuits, but it's a legitimate excuse because there's rampant over litigation right. in uh, the medical industry, and the one place where the Democrats are totally at fault is, you know, they are basically exactly. owned by the trial right, lawyers right, right. and they resist all medical malpractice reform. This is an article that, that neither political party is going to love too much. Uh, Democrats won't like it because you raise the issue of medical malpractice lawsuits and the litigious nature and of And because I say that Obamacare does nothing to attack the core problem, which is pricing which is why Obamacare was able to pass. I'm going to get to Obamacare, but... but and the Republicans won't like it because yeah. I say that actually the only efficient player in this marketplace is Medicare. Mm. It's the only efficient player, yet a lot of people look at Medicare and say it is the cost element of entitlements uh, that will bankrupt the country. Well, what's going to bankrupt the country is the continuation of what we have today. Medicare, the situation I described where you know, someone pays, um, well, if you look at the cover, the, right. uh, uh, the, yeah, MD, right. Anderson, uh, uh, yeah, right, uh, the right. MD Anderson Cancer Center right. is charging a dollar and a half for generic aspirin um, or yeah. Tylenol pill, okay? You can buy them on Amazon for 1.5 yeah. cents. Yeah, exactly. So, so you can buy it on Medicare, Amazon for 1.5 cents, and your hospital marks it up, you say, here, 10 Thousand right, percent. but not to Medicare, because Medicare takes the view. Medicare is ordered by Congress only to pay hospitals for their costs, their actual costs, including their overhead and including everything else. So Medicare takes the position in this particular case that if you're paying $1,791 a day for your room at MD Anderson, which is what they charge unless it's intensive care, that uh, they should throw in the aspirin for the $1,791 a day. Medicare would pay zero for that. And Medicare, um, again, pays hospitals their cost, including all their overhead. The hospitals say, oh, Medicare pays us much too little, but every hospital accepts Medicare patients. And in central Florida or all the places, you know, where there are lots, you know, where there's a high density of Medicare populations, they advertise for Medicare okay, patients. Okay, but do you agree that Medicare cost is the, one of the principal uh, entitlement cost that unless reform will bankrupt the economy? Yes, but here's how to lower the cost. Lower the age of Medicare, not raise it. You're opposed to raising the age so that you don't get Medicare until you If you want to save the taxpayers money in the context of Obamacare and our health care system today, I, I make, I think, a fairly cogent argument in this article that if you, if you lowered the age to 64, there's a woman in here who ends up in the emergency room, Bridgeport Hospital, right. um, who, no, at uh, the Stanford Hospital, who's 64 years old and 11 months, a month away from Medicare. She's got no insurance. Her bill is $21,000. Medicare would have paid about $800 for that. Now you say, well, okay, but the taxpayers would have paid the $800. She's going to pay the $21,000. First of all, she's not. She doesn't have the money. Second, under Obamacare, she will be required to have health insurance. 
she will pay much higher premiums because the big, uh, the big insurance companies, Aetna, Cigna, you name it, pay hospitals much, much more for that service than Medicare does because Medicare is you know, the big player in the marketplace. The insurance companies are really at the mercy of the hospitals, so she will have to pay a higher premium if she's 64. Mm -hmm. She won't be able to pay it. She's a school bus driver. Guess what happens? The federal government under Obamacare pays her premium. So they're going to pay a higher premium for her to have private insurance than it would cost them if she went into Medicare because mm -hmm. Medicare is such an efficient buyer. It cost Aetna $28 a claim to process yeah. a claim. It costs Medicare 89 cents a claim. Okay. So it's, it's just run a that. As you know, part of the political uh, uh, dynamic of America is that there's a feeling there out there that is often uh, engaged by politicians to say we need to take the government out mm -hmm. of health care and that was part of Obamacare's and the debate that took place mm -hmm. of course the president was reelected and mm -hmm. it was not a political uh, issue in the election as much as people thought it might be at one time Absolutely uh, right. but do you come to this favoring a single-payer system because no, of what I you don't. found in I Medicare? I think it's unrealistic to favor a system. You know, you know, we can sit here and have, you know, I can write essays, we right. can have wonderful wonk policy debates about single-payer. It's not practical. Which is kind of Medicare for everybody. But, but what I point out in the article is Medicare is the private sector. Medicare, there are 700 government employees working for Medicare and 8,000 private sector contractors. The difference is they operate under uh, the supervision of the law, which says you can't overpay hospitals, and they operate under the supervision of uh, long-time government civil servants who are actually really good at their jobs. Uh, but it is a private sector program, 8,000 private sector contractors and 700 uh, government employees. So Medicare is not a bunch of, you know, civil servants gone wild. It's not all, and it really works well. I taped the conversation here yesterday with Michael Porter, university professor at Harvard at the business school, but, mm -hmm. but uh, I know. is, a, as you know, a very yeah. distinguished professor at Harvard who is fascinated and, and studying health care mm -hmm. uh, and many other things. Here is what he said, and I want to see what your reaction is to it. Roll tape. Ultimately, healthcare fails the most basic test of organization, and that is it's not organized around the needs of the patient, it's organized around the supply of the services. And until we make that fundamental transformation, uh, we are hobbled in our ability to actually so called bend that cost curve, as people say. Agree with that? Yeah, I mean, it's of. even worse. I mean, he, he almost understates the problem. The problem is, as I conclude in here, healthcare is not a marketplace. The reason we, alone among all the developed mm. countries on the planet, um, don't have government-run health care is we have a tradition, which I support, of free enterprise and a free market. All good. Except if it's a free market. There's nothing free about that market. Let's go back to you going into the tie store. You can decide to buy the tie or not buy the tie. You can choose what kind of tie you like. You can, you can get price competition. There's no player in the current healthcare market, no buyer who has any kind of leverage over the seller except Medicare. for uh, Medicare right. because they're so big. So you can start to do reforms such as cap profits on hospitals, uh, stronger antitrust enforcement on hospitals, cap profits for God's sakes on prescription drugs. Why in America do we pay 50% more for the exact same drug than they pay in Germany, France, England? You pick your country. Tell me why. Because we alone don't regulate the price of drugs. We believe in a free market. Tell me what kind of free market it is. If, God forbid, I have cancer, you have cancer, and there's one kind of, there's one drug that can stop my cancer, where's the free market there? Every other country has stepped in. And you know what? The profit margins for those pharmaceutical companies in France and Germany and England and all the other places, they're pretty high. They're high enough so that these, you know, these companies are aggressively selling their drugs there. And they say, well, gee, we need the extra high margins so that we can do the research and development to develop drugs. Again, if you follow the money, as I did here, and you look at what they actually spend for research and development, uh, their profits way surpass what they spend for research. Okay, define for me comparative effectiveness. It's a pretty logical 
term, except in the world of healthcare. But what it what it means in healthcare is that you have a bunch of doctors, a panels, peer groups, right. who study. You know, let's say there's cancer drug A and cancer drug B. Cancer drug A is ten thousand dollars a dose. Cancer drug B is a thousand dollars a dose. People suspect that they might be equally effective, and in fact, people suspect that cancer drug B, the cheaper one, might actually be more effective. Because because it's just a better drug, it's a different drug, it works better on this cancer. So the, what comparative effectiveness does is it says let's study the outcomes when you give patients B versus A. So far so good, all logical, right? Congress has prohibited uh, Medicare from then saying, okay, we've just figured out that the $1,000 drug is actually more effective than the $10,000 drug, or the same, therefore we're only going to pay for the $1,000 drug. We, you know, we didn't decide this. Peer groups of doctors did exhaustive research. We're only going to pay for the thousand dollar drug, not the ten thousand dollar drug. Congress won't let Medicare do that. Guess why? Um, you think the military industrial complex is big in Washington? The healthcare industry spends four times as much lobbying. So more than defense contractors, uh, healthcare companies spend a lot more oh, to yeah. lobby the Congress than do defense contractors. Exactly. Right. You, you know, you open any Washington-based magazine like National Journal, you know, Politico, and it's filled with ads from healthcare companies urging Congress to spend money on this or not to curtail this program and not to pass a regulation allowing, for example, for comparative effectiveness. Uh, one simple explanation, one simple observation of Obamacare is that, in, and the president likes that term, but yeah, he, he, he didn't he, in the beginning. He embraced he it. Embraced it, exactly. Uh, is this notion that what they got right was access, but got nothing right about cost containment? That's exactly right. And, and, and access is a good thing. We, and, and, and it is a historic breakthrough that people, many more people will have insurance, not everyone. That's terrific. But step back and think about it. What they got access to was the ability for someone, in most cases the government, through um, you know, subsidizing insurance premiums, for someone to buy the health care products that the pharmaceutical companies and the hospitals and you know, the CAT scan makers want to sell. That's why Obamacare passed, because it was good for everybody except the taxpayers. Take a look at this. This again is Michael Porter talking about Obamacare. Here it is. It was fundamentally the reform of the insurance system, and many of the reforms were good, and uh, uh, so we, we need to give full credit there. Uh, but it, it was not uh, very, didn't go far enough in really thinking about how we were going to restructure the delivery uh, of care and um, how we were going to create um, uh, 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 primary care um, uh, uh, structures that were also able to prevent disease because one of the problems we have in healthcare is we've got a lot of preventable uh, things that are really driving the cost up at a very high rate and um, we haven't cracked the code of, of how to do that. The, the best work on prevention now is actually in the corporate sector. Uh, companies understand that if their employees are sick, uh, don't show up for work um, and, and get expensive illness, that's really expensive to the company. So despite the rhetoric I hear sometimes, thank God the employers are still in the healthcare system right. because the most progress we're making on health and wellness is actually in employers. You agree with that? He's a little bit wrong. Okay. Um, there are important aspects of Obamacare that, that do go to preventive care. For example, mm -hmm. uh, you and I are entitled uh, to a colonoscopy without a copay or right, a deductible. Right, right. Uh, women are entitled uh, you know, to various tests um, without a copay. So there is some element of subsidy for uh, preventive care. Where he's completely right, though, is it's simply you know, shifting, if you will, the deck chairs on the Titanic, um, and it doesn't deal with pricing. And if anything, it's going to cost more because you're going to create these insurance exchanges, which sound like a great thing. Yeah. Uh, but what did I say before? One of the big problems is that hospitals are consolidating, they're buying up practices and becoming so dominant in a community that even the two or three insurance companies that now might dominate that region can't really have any leverage against the big hospital. If you suddenly have 10 insurance companies dividing up market share in that region, the hospital is just going to mow over all of them. Mm. So uh, that's what I worry about. Rick Stengel, the managing editor of Time Magazine, said that you have, this piece is resolutely non-ideological. Right. Um, but was there an argument to be made by Republicans 
uh, during the debate over health care um, that, that, that either they didn't make or because of whatever fundamentalist principles they had that, that they thought it violated uh, or, or because everybody got lost in sort of the shorthand of uh, Well, I, I mean, I remember care. some. I wasn't as attentive then right. as I am now to this, but, you know, I remember the, go uh, the Republicans arguing that this put the government deeply into health care, that we're going to control yeah, your health care. And, and there's death nothing of that. And all that. Yeah, the, 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 there's nothing like that in Obamacare. Um, and again, it has several good things. For example, I describe how hospitals, you know, how hospital bill collectors done well, Some would argue mandatory insurance in that case is as an issue that has to do with the government. The government saying you have to have insurance. The, right. Exactly right. No, you're right about that. I stand corrected. But as a general matter, the, the government's not get. you know, the rhetoric I heard was the government's going to get between you and your doctor. There's, there's nothing right, that right, does right. that. Um, but um, what Obamacare does do, it, 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 it curbs the bill collecting um, activities of hospitals, although the American Hospital Association is fighting those regulations. Um, it does a lot of good things at the edges, um, but it doesn't attack the fundamental problem, which is everything costs too much. And the only way to deal with that is not through the free market, but by acknowledging that there can never be a free market for health care. You can't have it. It's not possible because the buyer can never have the same leverage and the same um, power as the seller. Is there any significance in the Congressional Budget Office report earlier this month that a sharp and surprisingly persistent slowdown in the growth of health care cost is helping to narrow the federal deficit? Is uh, that a one-time only thing or is no, there a significant there, there trend some, here that we ought to take notice of? That's, that's because, again, Medicare, not what you and I pay in health care through our insurance premiums, or but Medicare, there are some reforms, not enough, in, in Medicare that cut the cost that Medicare pays. Also, the economy has not been as good. You know, this is going back a year, yeah, two, right, or three. Right. But the inexorable trend, unless we do something, is obvious. Uh, this health care economy is going to eat us alive. I mean, it's almost as if, Charlie, we've been living in two worlds. In our world, in everybody's world, um, except the health care world, the economy's actually not been so great, in case you haven't noticed. Right. in, you know, the last, uh, you know, decade, or certainly the last, you know, five or six years, economy hasn't been so great. There are issues with employment, issues with income security, all this stuff mm -hmm. that we've all lived through. Then there's this other world in the United States called the, you know, the healthcare economy, mm -hmm. where everything has been booming. The jobs keep growing, incomes keep going up. Bitter Pill by Stephen Brill.